Oz Minerals saw a first half profit boost of 82% thanks to lower costs and the rally in gold. That offset a weaker copper production. Net profits for the period came in at almost $58 million, no doubt helping the miners' stock gain 38% this year. So we asked the CEO, Andrew Cole, about his predictions for copper and gold. That's a very difficult question. It's highly volatile as we see watching the price sort of spike up and down. So we're not actually making any predictions on where the gold price is going to go. I think we're very fortunate to have about a quarter of our operations exposed to the gold price currently. But I also think that could turn very quickly. We are seeing um, investors starting to move more strongly into copper as well, um, given the high price of gold. So, you know, our company policy generally is not to hedge or try and make predictions on these commodities. Um, we're a very low cost producer, so we like the volatility in the price. So that cautiousness makes me think that you won't be changing your strategy too much to try and capture more of the upside in gold? Uh, certainly not looking to try and hedge it, no. Um, we want the exposure. We've got a lot of gold coming through both our Prom Hill and Carapatina operations. Mm -hmm. um, so that prevent, uh, gives us a nice hedge, if you like, to a natural hedge to the copper that we produce. But no, not looking to lock in any pricing. Can you push production harder, though, at those mines? Well, we've already pushed production at Prom Hill considerably harder this year as a result of the gold price and where it's at today. So a lot of the uplift we've seen um, in our earnings um, uplift this year has been a result of us changing our mining sequence at Prominent Hill over the past 12 months to actually produce more gold. So we have had some flexibility to capture some of the opportunity that's presented itself to us. So you've already spoken about copper. I'm wondering how you see the copper price and the narrative evolving, given all of the uncertainties that we still associate with COVID-19 and the economic impact globally. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Look, it's a good question, Heidi. Look, I think starting firstly with the fundamentals, because I think that's where you need to start in a sector like this, which is, you know, decades long, and you make very big investments um, to span multiple cycles. So Fundamentally, the, 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 the dynamics for copper, both supply and demand, haven't changed. Um, it's still very difficult to find new copper deposits, and there really haven't been any big copper discoveries in, in, in a decade, really. And we know that the fundamental operating cost of the existing assets is getting higher and higher. And um, similarly, on the demand side, whether countries are building new infrastructure or consumers are consuming white goods, or um, high carbon emitting countries are trying to produce renewable energy to reduce their emissions. They are all very large users of copper. So it's a commodity that I feel very comfortable saying in the medium to long term, it's going to be very resilient. Do you expect an acceleration in de demand coming from, I guess, sort of one off things like potentially uh, an infrastructure boom out of the US? Because that is, you know, key to Joe Biden's platform, for example, that infrastructure investment that never quite materialized under President Trump, or from the infrastructure investment driven recovery that we're already starting to see in China? Uh, look, in short, yes. So I, I think we're already seeing stimulus packages and stimulus attempts around the globe. Um, and if you start in China, China is rapidly building copper smelting capacity because I, I believe it sees it as a strategic commodity and a strategic element to underpin its infrastructure program. Um, so any one-off stimulus infrastructure activities will invariably require copper in some element of that demand, um, um, project. So, and we're seeing stimulus programs all around the world, Australia included, to try and get economies back on their feet, if you like, get people employed. They all have a positive impact on the demand for copper. So all of those types of programs, um, no matter where they are in the world, really do have a positive impact on its demand.